So how does the overall uh, universal consciousness or cosmic perspective then apply to those who end up coming to your temple? It's a good question. So there's two things I'd like to say about that. One is, what kind of person can benefit from this cosmic perspective? I think it's an honest question to say, how would a homeless person gain from this kind of perspective? You know, because the idea would be this person is just looking for the basics, for shelter, for food, for example. But one of the things I found in my work, in my ministry, was that this perspective or this, this idea of, of this larger consciousness, this cosmic consciousness, is something that can lift people up no matter what station in life they're in. I remember doing a program for the homeless uh, a couple of decade, couple of decades ago, early on in my, my vocation. And people sort of scoffing at no one, no homeless person is going to come and learn about these things. And I thought that was kind of biased, um, that somehow homeless people are so different from you know people that have jobs and things of that nature. And in fact, the opposite was true. I did get large groups of people that would come out, and they were all homeless, and they they still could be lifted up uh, by this perspective. And in some ways, I used to say, you know, there's that. Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Remember that mm -hmm. when you were in college? Mm -hmm. And it was the idea that you had to get basic needs met first before you could explore self-actualization. One of the cool things about the Buddhist tradition is it says, kind of turns that upside down and says, no, you can have that self-actualization or a larger perspective and then the things in your life, whether they're whether you have you know a big home or you, you know maybe you're a wanderer, those parts of your life become manifestations of that bigger perspective, mm -hmm. and they don't define you; mm -hmm. you define them. Mm -hmm. So that's one big point to make. The second is one of the biggest things we practice is what we call mindfulness, and mindfulness is about helping to uh, helping people relieve uh, suffering, particularly psychological suffering. And so, when you look at the interdependent nature of things, so, you know, we talk about how, you know, everything is connected in an atomic structure, we're all connected in terms of DNA and genetics, and, you know, the elements of the stars are within me. When you understand that interdependence, if you look at the way the mind works, so the way I act in a given situation, whether it's assertive, or sort of passive, those actions are created by the feelings that I'm having, the emotions. And those emotions, in turn, are created by the thoughts that I'm having. Because the basic Buddhist teaching is that everything is founded upon our thoughts. Mm -hmm. And so when I realize that it's my thoughts that create that cycle, then mindfulness is about learning to engage those thoughts in a way that I bring clarity to. And when I bring clarity to my thoughts and my conditioned beliefs, then there's a natural flow through that interdependent chain of causation. Mm. So if I'm feeling really anxious, you know, I can try to calm myself down by doing things for the body. Mm -hmm. Or I can go right to the source, the thoughts that are creating it. And if I can unpack those thoughts mindfully, anxiety goes away on its own. Mm -hmm. But it's all rooted in this idea, what I call the three cosmic principles that come out of Buddhism, which are, number one, that everything is interconnected. We're not really separate. That the idea of this separation is a delusion, which is natural because it comes from us having every human being, in a way, sort of recapitulating the experience of that, those ancestors who first became self-aware, right? So babies become self-aware and everybody goes through this process of then trying to overcome that separation anxiety. So we're all like kids, you know, go through that separation anxiety. Well, I think all humans suffer from that <laughs> on a global level. And so the practice is about realizing first that that separation isn't true. And then the next practice is, is working with the nature of change. 
as a way to um, generate creativity. Like one of the things that Neil said is that knowledge for him is the foundation to creativity, and I agree with that. But I also think the practice of learning how to integrate change in our life is a very powerful way to engender creativity. For, mo for most people, change is one of those things that we all know is the constant, right, in the universe. And that's kind of like a foundational teaching of Buddhism. But most of us see change as an enemy because we either have to try to change to become something else or we get somewhere, but we don't want, to, we don't want anything to change because we're afraid it will go away. Yeah. And yet on some level, we all know that that's the way it works. So what this perspective does is try to encourage us to see and learn from the universe that nothing new in the universe can come into being unless there is great change. So for example, when a star dies, it goes supernova, that early experience of those supernovas, of those grand stars that gave birth to who we are, we wouldn't be here without that great change. So what it does is it kind of gets us to look at the supernovas in our own personal life and how can we use that to create change uh, and make, be, rather be creative within change. And then the third principle is the idea of the self. Now this is something that I really connected with in Neil's uh, writings where he says, you know, some people look at the universe and they feel very small and it kind of depresses them. And one of the things that Neil says is that a person who feels that way went into the situation with way too big an ego. <laughs> and, and, and that's exactly what Buddhism teaches. that. If you gain this big perspective and it makes you feel very small, it's because you're not seeing uh, yourself as the universe. Mm. That this very universe is the body of the Buddha, we say. Mm -hmm. And if you start to see yourself as all but one, then this idea of it shrinking you somehow or making you even feel more isolated disappears. And so that the teaching in Buddhism is very important and powerful. And what it does is it, it's, it's not that the ego is the enemy. Because really the ego self is just the conditioned being that we are in time and space. But by having a cosmic perspective, we can transcend the limits of the ego. And we can learn to care for the ego. So that I can be compassionate towards little Tony you know, and, and recognize his limitations and imperfections, but not let those things uh, congeal into an identity that he has to always protect. Mm -hmm. By having a bigger view of myself as the universe, my ego becomes more flexible and more porous so that my true self can shine through. So that's, that's probably the the practical way we do it. And so when we're working with people with anxiety or grief or anger, we use that that interdependent chain of causation to help them change that. Nice. And meditation, which is another tool, uh, is a way for them to uh, be able to step back and have that bigger perspective on their mind where they can watch their thoughts and feelings without identifying. And, and start to dig that they're, these are experiences they're having, but they're not them. And, and it, it might sound like semantics, but one of the things I try to get people to do is to stop using I am statements. So when someone says to me, I am anxious, you know, I try not to see, no, you are not anxious, you are having anxious feelings, mm -hmm. which is totally different. Mm -hmm. And I think words are important because words are the fingers that shape the mind. And if you don't understand some of those things, you don't work with them differently, you know, they continue to create a script mm -hmm. that you kind of follow unconsciously.